Hello and welcome to another Doctor Who DVD, or should I say Blu-ray review. In this first DVD review of 2016, I'll be looking at the Zavi exclusive Spearhead from Space Steelbook. Yes, now this review is going to be structured a little bit different to how I normally do uh, my reviews. Obviously, we'll be looking at this snazzy thing in a minute. But um, uh, once I've looked at the product, I'll be talking about how pivotal Spearhead from Space is and why I think it is such an important story. Not because it just introduced us to my favourite Doctor, but on how this could be the real game changer in Doctor Who. Um, so yeah, let's uh, look how this uh, DVD is presented. But um, DVD-wise, I am planning to bring back the DVD reviews. Slowly but surely, they will be back and uh, I think it's only fitting that they come back with a bang as the third Doctor is exiled to Earth and he's about to face the Autons. So let us face the Autons in the first DVD review. So for the presentation of this product, so for the cover art we have the third Doctor there, Liz Shaw, the sort of main Auton we see, we've got the meteorite shower, the sort of shockwave and we have the Autons from part 4 and some explosions and the Earth for the background. Now what I like about this and the Series 9 uh, Amazon exclusive Blu-ray steelbook is that they've managed to blend in this bit of slip card, which you can see there we'll see more of the cover. So it's nice how they sort of balance that in. And we have the Doctor Who there, Spare from Space, PG, BBC. That's the spine. We have Doctor Who, Spare from Space. And on the back of the card we have information on the story, the special features included, and some still images from the story, and some sort of weird jargon about the actual DVD. It's Removing the slipcase, we get this lovely photo of John Pertwee with the shockwave effect continued and the earth is there as well, sort of blended in with John Pertwee's The disc art, is, face. it is exactly the same as the and cover. And removing the disc, we can see this lovely photo of John Pertwee on location from Spear from Space with this nice galaxy nebula All right then, Spear from there. Space, I think, is one of the most important and pivotal moments in Doctor Who because Spear from Space is very much a template for the new series and you can just see that through the work like Rose. It is very much a carbon copy of Spare Heaven Space. But uh, Spare Heaven Space I think is a groundbreaking story because obviously um, the Patrick Troughton era was in decline. You know, viewing figures were dropping out. Stories like the Dominators were just killing the viewing figures for Doctor Who. And the schedule was killing Patrick Troughton so that led to the first change being the whole schedule revamp because season six had about six, uh, well, seven stories, and season seven was dropped to four stories. Um, obviously, majority of those episodes in season seven were seven parts, um, with the exception of Spear from Space just being a four-parter. Um, so we had that new format, um, uh, with it just being four episodes per season. But uh, as the Pertwee years went on uh, in season eight, that would be extended to five and it would remain the same for the whole of the Pertwee tenure. Now, obviously, because the Patrick Troughton era was in decline, they needed a strong actor to boost the viewing figures, and they got John Pertwee, who I absolutely adore, as you all know. And I think that he very much established the role as the Doctor and built uh, the foundations for Tom Baker's Doctor. I think that John Pertwee made it a success. Um, and laid the foundations for Tom Baker's Doctor to just make it rise even more and become, you know, one of the greatest Doctors of all time for Tom Baker. But I think that John per without John Pertwee, uh, the foundations wouldn't have been laid down for Tom Baker to do what he did. Um, so that's why I think that John Pertwee had quite a hard job. Not as hard as Patrick Troughton, but he still had a hard job to sort of boost the viewing figures and lay down the foundations of the show and where it would go for the next... 40 or so years and still is going uh, in the same direction as it were. So obviously it introduced us to the third Doctor as played by John Pertwee and it is the first episode to be in colour. Obviously that would be quite a luxury uh, back in the day having a colour television so this episode might have been seen in black and white but obviously this was the first episode to be filmed in colour. Um, I, it's quite odd because I think there's a statistic um, about how many people still watch black and white television in the UK, I think it's like 30 or 26 percent. I mean, I don't Bear know. From space that's beside the point. Just seems like a completely different story to what we are used to. If you saw the Patrick Troughton era, this just seems like a breath of fresh air. But it's all done on location. Now, this was a happy accident and turned out to be 
a great success because obviously it led for this story to be put on Blu-ray and that is why it's I think will be the only classic DVD on Blu-ray because of this because it's filmed on a different camera I think like 16mm film something like that I mean I don't know the technical side of it but um, this story never nearly didn't happen because of sort of weird sort of I think it was technical strikes at the time so that's why it was done all on location which I think which I will say in the review gives the story a different feel and it just adds this sort of cinema quality this sort of movie quality which I don't, I'm not really a fan of the classic series having this movie quality but Spare from Space, it just works because the storyline just is there to support that quality. Um, and obviously, this is quite a bold move for the production team to move it to Earth and set it all Earth based, um, which I think was a, a sort of a groundbreaking move because obviously it meant more terrifying stuff for kids because the threats could be more of a reality than us going to see the jelly monsters. Yeah, that needs to be put on a t-shirt for Jelly Monsters. And my final point is this is when Robert Holmes started to become a prolific classic writer. Obviously, he wrote stories like The Space Pirates and The Crotons, which I do like Crotons, but I think this is when Robert Holmes found his sort of his traditional classic Doctor Who writing, you know, horror and just scaring the crap out of everyone using everyday items, you know, the Autons are just fantastic and creepy. And this is when I think that Robert Holmes become that prolific uh, Doctor Who writer, which we all love, of the classic series. So now onto the actual review of Spare from Space. Space was the second third Doctor story I saw, and this was a story what sold me on the third Doctor, and this is when the third Doctor became my favourite Doctor. So Spare from Space is a very special story for me for that reason. And like I've said before, this is my favourite introduction story to any Doctor as we see the third Doctor arrive with a bang, bursting Doctor Who into colour. Now the story itself, part one of the story doesn't really focus on the Doctor, it's more establishing uh, the main plot points and the characters, with the Brigadier um, I think is the main driving force of part one, um, and sort of obviously re-establishing Unit, um, whereas the Doctor becomes the sort of prominent feature in part two, part three um, is very much setting up the nesting plan and then part four is the nesting's downfall, which is quite odd really because it's like the last sort of five or six minutes of the actual story where we see the nesting's defeated. So they have got quite a prominent lead and you think, how are they going to wrap this up in six minutes? But they obviously, they do it brilliantly, superb, whatever you want to say. They just wrap it up brilliantly and it just sets the, the show in a brilliant new direction. Uh, from now on to characters, obviously I'm going to start with the main man, the third Doctor, played by John Pertwee. Yes, this is the most comedic we see the third Doctor as obviously John Pertwee had a comedic background um, before doing Doctor, I think this is sort of his first television sort of straight role because he was renowned for doing comedy because he did this uh, radio series called The Navy Lark which I think is the longest running comedy radio series, um, I believe, I'm not sure if that's right but I think it is. Um, so naturally you're going to write Pertwee um, as a sort of a comedic part, you're going to write the Doctor as a comedic part because obviously you write for the actor's strengths and in this, in this case you know John Pertwee was renowned as a comic actor but John didn't want to take it that route but so um, about halfway through part two we see the third Doctor just change rapidly so we can see but you can say the comedic side was him sort of finding out his doctor so it's sort of a change over from Pat's doctor to John's doctor so halfway through part two we see uh, the authoritative side of the doctor when he arrives at the gates um, where the brigadier is and that's where we see the authoritative side of the third doctor which we all know and love now the third doctor has some great moments within this story um, and like I said he gets some naturally funny moments especially when he's trying to find his shoes. Isn't that a great first line? Shoes, I must find my shoes. And the nurse is trying to put him back in his bed and he's like, unhand me man. And it just leads him to some great moments. And as an eight year old, I just fell about laughing. And this is probably the scene where I just thought, God, I love the third doctor. I mean, part three of Inferno sold me on the third doctor, but this moment is when it cemented me as a third doctor fan. Um, now, like any um, introduction story, uh, it's meant to show off or showcase the main features of this Doctor, what we're going to see later, obviously 
you've got the great action side of the Doctor of him throwing, him throwing himself into danger, like the wheelchair sequence, which is just a great uh, moment. Uh, we've got his gadget constructing, he's got his gadget side where he constructs gadgets to defeat the Nestine. Uh, he's got his, his eccentric side when he's sort of cho choosing his dandy flamboyant outfit and uh, going in the vintage car, you know, it's very eccentric. And of course, you've got his sort of persuasive side, you know, he's trying to persuade the brig to keep that red car, uh, what he stole from the hospital, and, and somewhere to work in persuading Liz to get the key. And I think the final moment of the story where, you know, the brig's like, I don't even know your name. And you just see John just turn around and go, it's Dr. John Smith. And you get this nice, great little twinkle in his eye and this nice little glint. And you just think, yes, he is the doctor. Because um, you've got that sort of childish quality to him in that sort of one moment. You can just see this sort of inner child uh, within him. And you can see that uh, the show's going in this nice, fabulous direction. And the show's in safe hands as John Pertwee is the doctor. Liz Shaw, played by Caroline John. Liz, to me, is very much a break the mold companion as she's very much the Doctor's equal. As normal companions are normally sort of passing the test tube, but Liz is the one conducting the experiments this time. You could say Zoe is one of those companions as well, but I think that Zoe um, was a bit more up, um, was surpassed the Doctor's intelligence, but she was more clever than the Doctor. I mean, in the Crotons, you know she beats the Doctor on that intelligence test to see the Crotons. So whereas Liz, I feel, is more of that sort of equal to the Doctor. Um, and I think that Liz is very much an underrated um, companion. And Caroline John, I think, in this story gives a very nice subtle performance. We were just using her facial exp expression to explain her character's feeling. You know, we have this nice bit of background information that she went to Cambridge and uh, when she first sort of talks to the Brigadier but she's sort of taking the mick out of the unit um, and the Doctor and Liz just have this great chemistry as soon as they sort of start talking to each other you can see this great sort of rapport between the two characters um, and you know the Doctor saying oh do I really have to call you Miss Shaw and you know they just laugh about it and it's just great chemistry and you can just see they have this great workmanship especially in part three and four when they're trying to just stop the nesting they just have this great chemistry uh, between them, I think Liz, uh, Caroline John gives this nice subtle performance, you know, but we're drawn by her just by raising an eyebrow and you're just instantly drawn to her. You know, but she doesn't have to be um, screaming and shouting, she can just raise an eyebrow and you're just drawn to her. So she gives this nice subtle performance. Now on to Nick Courtney, the Brigadier. Uh, he slips into ro the role with great ease of him having this, pres this ever-present stern quality with him having a great smugness uh, to his performance when talking about Unit to Liz and being so sure that the Doctor has returned um, leading to the Brigadier's denial saying that's not, that's not the Doctor um, and you know when uh, the Doctor arrives in the lab you can see that the Brigadier and the Doctor's relationship is already uh, frosty and you can tell that the Brigadier, uh, well the Brigadier knows that he's in for a bit of a rough ride uh, with this incarnation of a doctor he's going to struggle uh, keeping uh, this doctor in line. Um, another moment what I forgot to mention with Caroline John is that the way she sort of played getting the doctor's TARDIS key um, that was just a great little funny moment you know with the brig just trying to deal with this situation and Liz is just there just saw the key and just took it and the brig didn't even notice because he's too stuck up in his own little business. So yeah, that was a great moment for Now on to the main villain of this story, uh, Hugh Burden who played Channing. Uh, what an absolutely creepy character. The way he was shot and the music what goes around him is just superb with him, with us just seeing these big eyes in this sort of corrugated sort of window. Uh, so from, right from the off, you know that he's the bad guy and Hugh Burden does a fantastic job bringing him to life as he has this rather uh, still, that he's rather still um, and making us as audience members drawn to him uh, on screen as you've got these massive eyes um, making him have this sort of distant feel like he's not quite in the room but you know he's there which gives him this sort of eerie quality so you can sort of tell that he's sort of alien that he's not all there but he's in the room but he's got this very distant feel which I really do like so you can sort of see that he's sort of far away from an alien planet if you look into it like that um, really and you do get this sort of sense of danger uh, from him with him you know not to be you know you, you don't want to mess with him um, you know that he will get his autons on you and you'll be totally destroyed 
um, like that person who sort of worked at the factory and got sacked. Um, and, you know, obviously with him being a person not to be messed with, this leads to a fantastic confrontation with the third Doctor in episode four. Now, another character what I've got to mention is Sam Seeley, played by Neil Wilson, who's sort of the typical country bumpkin character, who I just find rather amusing. He's sort of a developed uh, pig bin Josh from uh, Claws of Axos, that tramp character from Claws of Axos. Um, and he's just a rather sort of sexist sort of character. Um, you know, saying to his wife, I'm hungry woman, make me a sandwich. And you just sort of feel bad for laughing, but you just laugh anyway. Um, you know, and him talking about uni, about the meter writing, if there's any sort of reward. Um, just a great performance by him, and he's sort of a nice little addition to the story, um, really. And it just, he's just a great character. I really do like um, Now Sam onto the main Seeley. threat, the Autons. They are just creepy in this. Um, because I live by a woods, I was always scared of a case like an autumn would come lurking out of the woods and this story made me sort of have a fear of plastic dummies for a while as I think that the design of them having hair, I know that sounds silly but I think they look rather creepy with them having hair I mean in episode 4 you know the ones in the shop windows you can see the performers eyes um, which isn't a negative it just adds to the sort of horror factor uh, for me and the music when they come to live in part 2 is just creepy and that weird sort of spring noise and the killing spree in episode 4 is excellently shot and the idea of total destruction is just great but you can be killed and you would never know that you had gone. Um, and also, unlike the new series, these Autons run and that just scared the crap out of me because I was just like, ah, they can chase after me now. Um, so the Autons I think are really creeping, are really a tour de force in this. But they, You do get a sense of danger of them when they're sort of going on that killing spree in episode 4 and when the soldiers are attacking them and you can see the bullets going right through them you can just tell that they are a great force within this. Right then, onto the Blu-ray itself. Uh, Spare from Space just becomes more alive and cinematic with everything just pops and just becomes more vibrant especially in the scenes in the woods, the hospital, the lab and the plastic factory. I mean, I've noticed sort of new details within the story, I mean, on the third Doctor costume that he's got this nice sort of pattern design on his collar, which I don't remember seeing on the special edition uh, in the Mannequin Mania box set. So you can sort of see these new uh, details uh, within the story. I mean, my only sort of negative uh, for this is, you know, the sort of Auton slaves, what you get with sort of the wax uh, makeup. That doesn't really translate um, well onto uh, the actual Blu-ray itself. Um, but obviously if we go lower definition it's fine, I mean the, the one where it looks the most dodgy is sort of the girl in the factory what sort of takes people to uh, Channing, um, well his sort of little secretary guy um, played by John Woodner um, who we all know from Terror of the Zygons. Um, but like I was saying everything just pops and becomes more vibrant especially the costumes. Um, the third Doctor, you know the flash of the red cape, it just becomes more alive and the dark blue jacket, it just stands out so well. Um, especially on the, sort of when he, they go into the factory and you get John Putty doing that lovely showman bit where he just lights the door and the lock bursts and he does that flash and you see the big flash of the red cape and you're just like, yes. The reason I picked this up was for uh, the Dandy and a Clown documentary which is the life and uh, career of John Pertwee which um, really does sum up uh, John Pertwee's life, the title, a Dandy and a Clown, but he's renowned for being a comedy uh, actor and obviously he's famous for being uh, the Doctor um, and I'm thinking of doing a video about uh, why I love John Pertwee, why is he, why is he my favourite actor and why he's my favourite Doctor so maybe that'll be my next discussion video if uh, uh, I plan to do it which I would like to do it at some point um, yeah that's a video I've got on the cards so maybe that will happen uh, in the near future and I just think it's a great documentary uh, seeing some sort of footage about his life and seeing him do all these sort of weird, his dangerous sort of stuff and you really get an insight on his life and what he did to sort of unwind when he wasn't filming Doctor Who and you got to go through all his stages of his life obviously I've been re uh, reading Moon Boots and Dinner Suit, his autobiography so getting more of an insight about that, uh, about his life is just an added little bonus so this is a great little feature on the DVD and it's definitely a must for me uh, and because we love John Pitt that's a definitely definitely a must. Um, there's obviously a documentary about Caroline John who sadly uh, passed away so it's sort of a tribute video 
and I found it quite a fascinating uh, documentary um, because you've got Jeffrey Beavers giving some quite sort of heartfelt moments about Caroline John. It's quite fascinating learning about her early life and how she came to be an actress and all that. So I thought that was very interesting. Uh, and it's definitely an interesting watch and it's made me appreciate Caroline John uh, even more. So those are the sort of two sort of exclusive sort of special features. You get a coming soon trailer, which is of the Green Death Special Edition, which is already out and sort of stock footage of the title sequence of sort of that testing really. Um, so to conclude, The Spare from Space, if you've already got it on Blu-ray, then you can easily pass on this, but if you're a third Doctor fanatic like me, then this is definitely a must. Uh, obviously I've got Spare from Space when it was originally released on DVD and I got the special edition um, when it came out in the Mannequin Mania box set, and now I've got this, and it's definitely a gorgeous thing to have so if you're definitely a fan of the third doctor then definitely check it out spared from space i've got to give it a 10 out of 10 10 dandies out of 10 fantastic story and definitely worth the money so yeah thank you very much for watching this review and i'll see you on my next review whatever that will be so thank you very much and bye bye